Welcome, everyone. I'm Dave Goldberg, president of the Investor's Source, your source of all welcome, wealth and wisdom. I am uh, thrilled to have with us today a very, very special guest from right here in my hometown of Loveland. We have the mayor, uh, Jackie Marsh. And it's just a pleasure to have you joining us today, Mayor Marsh. Well, thanks for having me. And we're going to talk about a topic that hasn't come up to city council yet. So I haven't done any independent research and I don't have any hard and fast dug in stances at this point. <laughs> okay, that's that's absolutely fine. Uh, yes, like you said, I'm sure this topic, which is short term rentals or Airbnbs, is going to be coming to the city at some point, but we'll even talk about why maybe it's not. So uh, at this point right now, I'm going to give a little introduction of Mayor Marsh. And uh, so uh, Mayor Marsh has been mayor since 2017. In addition to her mayor mayoral duties, Jackie is a small business owner or was in her prior professional life. Jackie has worn many hats. Some include early childhood teacher for the Department of Social Services, bookkeeper for a dental clinic, trade show marketing manager, purchasing manager, and purchasing director for an international software company and general manager for a large home service provider. Uh, we also had a conversation right before we started that Jackie was an avid runner and racer and the inaugural winner of, I believe it was called the Crazy Legs <laughs> uh, race ago. in New York City, where I used to run races and marathons. So we have a little kinship there. Um, and I was hoping, and this is going to be a little surprise for the mayor, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that tomorrow being August 1st and uh, an election coming up, I was hoping that she would disclose on this show right here today why if she is going to be running for mayor the next term, she said she puts it off till August and this won't air till August. So, <laughs> Mayor, are you ready to take that plunge on our show here? No, not yet. And I, I, I don't think I've ever announced that early. I've run three times, 17, 19 and 21. Unfortunately, the mayor only serves two years. I think it should be four so I, you know, I'm watching the race. Currently, you have three people in it. It's like, you know, who's in it? How's it going? Um, you know, there are differences of opinions between at least a couple of us. And I, I care about the city. I care about, you know, both the people, the employees, um, the small businesses. So I watch and see, is there anybody running that I could support and, and step aside myself? Or do I think I need to? you know, keep championing the things that I champion. So I, right I don't know. I can't give you an answer. I haven't, I haven't decided. Oh, rats. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, and Mayor Marsh is affectionately known as the people's mayor. And I think there's good reason for that. She has a strong connection with the city of Loveland and, and the wants and needs of the people here. So thank you for your service, Mayor Marsh. Let's dive right into talk about uh, short-term rentals, which, as you say, has not really been a hot-button issue in Loveland yet, and yet the affordable housing and housing in general definitely is an issue in the city. Um, so can you tell us why you think afford this, this, issue, this issue of short-term rentals, which has come up in other cities and they're trying to limit them, has not uh, come up yet in Loveland, provided that um, there there is a housing situation in Loveland. What do you think? I, you know, I, I can see this topic from several different positions. I can see it from the uh, position of being a property owner. I own this property. Don't tell me what to do with my property. And, you know, I ought to be able to rent it out long term, short term. I, I certainly see that. Um, aspect to it. I, I see the need for housing, workforce housing. We want people that work in the city of Loveland to be able to live here. Um, there is a housing shortage, which of course drives up, you know, the prices. There's also the neighborhood concerns of short-term rentals. You know, 
it's a different attitude when you live on the street and your um how you behave and your day-to-day -day life your structure when you're a resident versus when you're on vacation <laughs> and you might be in town for an event or a party or whatever and the attitude uh, is different and that can affect your neighbors if every weekend or every few days there are new people that may not know the garbage collection days that may not you know, necessarily fit in with the neighborhood that's full of residents. Um, you know, so I, I can look at this from several angles. I used to own a building on 4th Street, downtown Loveland, and then I had a business on the street level. But upstairs, there were two apartments. I lived in one. There was a time when the second one I rented out as an Airbnb. And then I went to a full-time, you know, uh, resident living there mostly because it was easier for me not to have to be changing sheets and, you know, having it cleaned and everything. It was a lot less hassle when somebody lived there year round. So I've experienced, you know, both. Um, it, again, I can see it from many angles. At the point that, you know, it's a, it, when it becomes a person's business, in other words, you have a home that you live in and maybe six months out of the year, you want to travel. You want to go to Europe or Mexico or the Caribbean, whatever, and you want to rent out your home while you're gone. That's one type of short-term rental, right? It might be an agency that's taking care of it. Maybe people are in there for a few weeks or a month or all the months versus somebody that's purchasing homes for the purpose of short-term rental is that person not becoming a business owner and if it's a business does that person need to comply with the same codes that an embassy suites would need to comply with and at what point can we count that um, in with our stock of um, hotels and you know places where tourists can stay you know so you know it's i I think it has to be looked at on many different levels. Are you a person that want, owns a home and lives in a home and you have a second home? Maybe you have a second home in Red Feather and you want to be able to stay in that part of the summer and you want to rent it out the rest of the time. That's different than a person that owns 20 homes in Red Feather, right? Absolutely. You know? Yeah. You know, and so where, where, where do you draw the lines and what kind of regulations do you need to make it sure that the place is safe for somebody, egress out of the house, you know, no, where, where is your responsibility to the neighborhood? Um, yeah, it's, it's a complicated yeah. issue. Yeah. And all those things make a lot of sense as far as when you and I spoke a little bit about regulation and regulating these. And there, I think there are some really good regulations to, to make sure that the issues that you brought up and things like noise and are, you know, are people taking care of their units are addressed and they don't bring down the rest of the neighborhood. So those are great points. Uh, I do think, you know, a lot of this increase in the numbers of Airbnbs or short term rentals over the years is driven by demand that people need if if there wasn't the demand these wouldn't have popped up so and i wanted to ask you i've been to some council meetings and heard that there is a hotel shortage in loveland and do you think that these short-term rentals are maybe helping to address some of the lack of that kind of space in the city at least temporarily and just like the, the previous part of that conversation, this too has a few aspects. So yes, you meet a need because clearly, you know, if you have, you know, if, you know, short-term rentals flourishing, you're meeting a need, right? Um, but are you, are you keeping more hotels from developing because that pressure is being relieved on the hotels and motels that we have? You know, it's almost like a fire department or a police department. If you have officers, firefighters doing overtime, 
are you masking the need for additional personnel? <laughs> you know, are you covering up for the lack of sufficient rooms um, by, you know, all these short-term rentals? And I'll go back to the idea that, you know, there's, a, I think, a legitimate purpose and need uh, fulfilled that pe they, we have people that maybe they, they're renting out a, a bedroom or an ADU in their backyard, that it provides an income that's needed, you know, by a, a certain percentage of our population. That's a real concern as well. You know, I, I think, you know, this is not necessarily a short-term rental, but I see that there'll be an increase in people that share their homes amongst unrelated people because there's a need for that. Um, and you have, you know, you have a whole industry of like visiting nurses, visiting executives that may need a place for one to three months. You know, it's, it works out better and for some people to be in that type of setting versus in a hotel room. If you're going to be in town because you have a, a three month stint at McKee Hospital, um, you know, your quality of life during those three months may be better by renting either an entire house or just a room in a house than staying at a hotel. Exactly. So, you know, where do the needs, you know, how do we, you know, how do we meet the needs, various needs, um, and still, you know, protect the neighbors and protect the safety? You know, some of these places that are being rented are probably not not entirely safe. Because well, they're not regulated. <laughs> right. Absolutely. I think there is a balance there of, you know, regulation. And I don't think you want to over-regulate either. But, you know, I think en encouraging free enterprise, even going back to your point about hotels and, uh, you know, there are obviously other factors for not building hotels and that they're expensive. And there are probably other regulations that have to be met to, put up a hotel, but uh, in general, I think if you let the market dictate what the needs are and then let the market fill those needs, I think in general, that's a positive thing. Um, yeah, I think sometimes we in Loveland underestimate the value of our city as far as a tourist um, area and our you know, location being, in my opinion, a gateway to Rocky Mountain National Park. You know, I know back in 2014, 15, when I was attending city council meetings, as you do now, and giving public comment, you know, I used to advocate for a hotel downtown, you know, and I, I call it a boutique hotel. And I had, you know, city staff, some ridiculed me, no hotel will ever come into downtown. And I think, and, and obviously we now have one, a Marriott that I'm told is doing very well. Um, so sometimes I think we don't see ourselves for who we are and the potential that we have. You know, I think there's a lot of room for growth in the tourist industry in Loveland, you know, and all throughout Northern Colorado. I, you know, having lived in other areas, you don't need to have an amusement park to draw people. We are our own draw for the outdoors. The beautiful mountains are, you know, we're 35 miles or so from Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, outdoor biking, kayaking, hiking, bicycling. You know, we have uh, everything that a lot of uh, recreational people want to do. You don't need to have a, a Disneyland in your backyard. That attracts a different type. You know, you have people that travel for a wellness, people that travel for outdoor. You have foodies. You know, you have art. We are a great art community. I think personally we could handle a, a number of additional hotels, but that's for the market to determine and to build. That's not something the city can regulate and say, we want to add three hotels. Right. You know, they have to see the market. I'm very pleased that Marriott decided to open in downtown Lowell. Yeah. I think it's a win-win for everybody. Right. I, I think we could handle more. We could handle more campgrounds as well on the way to Rock. I would love to see Loveland be a base camp, you know, for Northern Colorado, not just Rocky Mountain National Park. Right. Yeah, no, there's yeah. obviously a huge amount that the city has to offer. And I think people 
do know about it and do come to Loveland and there's always room for improvement there. Uh, getting back to housing and affordable housing, yeah. their common kind of wisdom out there seems to be that as more and more short-term rentals open up within a city, that's taking more houses off the market and driving up prices and um, yeah, and in and in the short term, that is adding to the the affordability crisis because there aren't as many units around to be rented and driving up home prices to sell because there are fewer homes to be sold, and there tends to be a knee jerk reaction. And, that, and those statistics have been proven out at least in the short term that there is at least a temporary rise in prices. What I've seen, there seems to be a knee-jerk reaction on the part of cities that, oh no, uh, prices are going up. We've got to do something about uh, limiting these the number of Airbnbs that we can have in a city. And they start imposing these regulations to, to limit that growth. Do you feel like that is the the solution to this? Or in my mind, it's let the market figure out what is needed. And we're already seeing a drop in in uh, occupancy rates and Airbnbs. So I think things are starting to naturally shift. But do you think a city limiting, artificially limiting this kind of growth is the way to approach this situation? Well, that, you've asked a very complicated question. Yeah. And because we haven't studied it, I don't know what percentage of our home sales are to people that are in. I personally know a couple of people that have purchased second homes, you know, in the downtown area as a, a short term rental property. Is the, I don't think it's a huge scale at this point, but I could be wrong because we haven't studied it. Um, Northern Colorado is a very desirable place to live. And it is, people are moving here because it is a desirable place. So there is a housing shortage. I would say short-term rentals are as small. <laughs> I would not say it's a huge problem at this point. Being able to build affordable with the price of land, with um, you know the water costs that it, it costs, those are, I think, the bigger issues of, of, of building affordable housing. Um, I think there are things that we could do. Um, you know, one of the things that I've floated is, you know, if somebody owns an apartment building, whether it's um, a fourplex, an eightplex, or 50 units, how can we make it easier for a property owner to sell individual units? Maybe they want to sell the entire complex. That's their right to do that. But maybe they'd like to sell half of their units. Well, we gain by now, say it's a, an apartment complex with 100 apartments. If you sold half of them, we now have 50 new homeowners that are vested into their property. You need to set up an HOA to cover common costs like a new roof or repaving the driveways and you know parking lots. I would advocate that, you know, and I, and I say this because my, my mother in California, before she passed away, bought a 533 square apartment, <laughs> you know, and it allowed her to age in place in her home. Um, and, and it provided her a lot of security that her rent wouldn't go up, that it wouldn't be sold out for money. So I know that it works in other communities. So how, how can we inspire people and remove any kind of stumbling blocks? You know, when you build an apartment, you build it to code for fire safety. You know, you you know whatever the walls are and ceilings are. You know, well, how can we make that feasible for somebody to purchase? Um, and then you have you know seniors that hopefully you know um, you know are going to live a wonderful long life, but may not want to stay in a home that's too large that is expensive for home insurance, property tax, utilities, maintenance, keeping up with a big yard. You know, how can we um, build affordable for them? There is a, a kind of a, 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 a trend right now, smaller lot sizes. I toured some homes in Berthoud, which are a thousand square feet, but half is on ground level, two story. 
Well, that's great. A thousand square feet for a senior is probably a great size for them to maintain, maybe two bedrooms, two baths, right? Great size. But can they age in place with it being two story? So maybe when we're constructing a whole development like that, and we're going to have 200 of those, you know, smaller units, maybe we build them with the idea that at some point, you install an elevator chute on the outside that opens into each level of the home. It's not a, a ton of additional money. It's much cheaper for that person to stay in that home than it is to go earlier to an assisted living. You know, so kind of think out forward, how can we start building for the various needs of different stages of life? You know, if you, if you can desire, you know, build desirable, affordable places for your seniors to move that will have peace of mind the rest of their lives and free up existing inventory for families that need the extra space and need to be close to schools. You know, I think there are different ways to get at the problem is what I'm saying. <laughs> and, and we need to look at all of it. You know, we need a higher density in our corridors, you know, it's, you know, people that um, are commuting, it's very expensive transportation. So higher density in the corridors, you're 287, you're th 34, you know, some of those quarters so that people can maximize, um, you know, their lower their cost of living and more than just the housing issue. Yeah, no, I, I love the, the ideas that you're throwing out where local government can actually come in and uh, to me, if there's over regulating again an overreach by governments or state governments that can discourage investment and and actually have the reverse effect that that you want to have happen which is to create more affordable housing so some of the solutions you're throwing out about making it easier for a an apartment owner to sell his units mm -hmm. and then maybe some kind of uh, an elevator or something in an apartment building but to me, if if you can, rather than mandating those things, offer incentives for the builders to make it worth their while, I think that's a much more cooperative way to go to, you know, rather than using the stick, use the carrot and make it make it worth everyone's while to do these kind of things that, uh, you know, lead to solutions that that can work. So uh i appreciate the those those that kind of thinking where government can make it easier for the real estate community to be successful and offer housing well and the idea of the elevator is for an individual detached you know thousand square foot i toured some in bertha not long ago and it's an affordable housing developer is doing a great job and in touring and i thought wow the size is perfect for seniors but it's a stairwell access to the second floor. Well, that's gonna prevent them from buying these affordable homes. Right. But if you had, if you left a space and planned for a space that is say either in your garage or your side yard or your backyard, that a person could approach from the outside, enter the elevator that takes them up to the, the second floor or opens into the main floor. You know, a few years ago, looking in the elevator or something like that was about 26,000. Okay, that that's if you're having to pay assisted living at five thousand dollars a month, if you can stay in your home an extra couple of years because you you can install an elevator when it be built when the home is built, but when it's needed, you've you've planned for it, you've allowed for the space in the yard or the garage for that, you know, you might help seniors be able to purchase those affordable homes being built and you free up a larger home that a family might need. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, good. We're, we're kind of coming down to the end of our time, and I thought okay. I would just see if you have any final thoughts on short-term rentals or on affordable housing in general. And um, You know, I would equate it to, like, you know, recently the city council um, increased the number of unrelated people that can share a home. It was you plus two, now it's five. Five unrelated people can live in a home. If you can show you have parking on site, you know, that, that can go to seven. 
Well, maybe that's what we need to look with people that are buying short-term rentals. Um, at the point that it becomes a business, maybe that's when you need to have some regulation in terms of safety and thought about neighbors and you know, you need to follow some of the code that is there for hotels and stuff. I don't know. It's, I'm thinking outside the box because we really haven't dealt with this issue yet. I'm just giving you that I'd be open to learning and finding out what other cities are doing and hearing from neighbors, hearing from people that are using the short-term rentals. I mean, yeah, it's a big, yeah. big topic. Right. Well, thank you. I want to just give uh, the mayor credit for her courage and coming on talking about something that really hasn't been a big issue in Loveland yet, thankfully, I think, and just being willing to kind of think it out here as we we talk. So thank you yeah. for being on today. Uh, great having you and getting some of your thoughts on on the housing market and crisis in general and short term rentals. And we really appreciate you being on with us. So thank you, Mayor. We'll see you tomorrow night, City Council. Uh, it sounds good. Everyone come. Okay. <laughs> Goodbye. Right, tune in. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Bye, <laughs> Bye David. Bye, Jackie.